Hello. I thought it was about time I made an update to this wheelchair farm rover project thingy. Um, the reason I haven't done any videos on this recently is because I really haven't made any progress that's worth showing. So this video, unfortunately, is just going to be a collection of trials and attempts and failures. And also, I'm just sort of hoping that somebody may see something that could be done that will help to figure things out. So since it's been quite a while since the last video, I thought I might just recap and give an outline of what's going on and what the problem is. So this wheelchair um, has a few different sections to it. This is the Shark Bus Remote. So this is what I'm going to be calling the remote for the rest of the video. This is the power module. And then there's this thing called the attendant control unit. So my plan was to try and emulate or pretend to be this attendant control unit and take over control of the wheelchair. Because when there's an attendant control unit connected to the system, this shark bus remote will defer control to the attendant control unit and give that one priority. And the way these communicate is using a RS-485 bus, which is a little bit like a UART connection, except there are two wires and they are controlled differentially which just means that when one goes high the other one will go low and you can see on the scope here so the yellow one will be normally low and then it goes high for these points while the blue one is going low um, and what we see here is a collection of pulses um, and this pulse this collection of pulses is the message that comes from the remote so this thing is generally in the normal case it's in control of everything and it initiates the communication on this bus. So the first set of pulses is coming from this, and the second set of pulses here is the power module which will reply. So this thing oops, is going to reply to that first set of pulses. After that set of pulses will come the attendant control unit. If it exists, there will be some more pulses here. Uh, at least that's how it works in an older version of the system, which I think mine is not. I have a newer one, from what I can tell. And another sort of a spanner in the works is this thing that happens at the beginning when the system wakes up from the sleeping state. The remote will give this very high voltage pulse. This is the full battery voltage, so it goes, this is uh, 10 volts vertical scale here. So we're looking at about 24 well, it looks more like 22 there, but it's, it's full battery voltage anyway, whatever that happens to be. So that is enough voltage to blow up any little chips or something that are not properly protected when it goes high. And it just goes high for 300 milliseconds to wake up the power module at the beginning and get everything started. So um, anything that's going to be emulating, if you want to pretend to be this, you're going to have to do that somehow to wake up this thing and get it, get it all started. So at the end of the last video, I think I had just connected my Arduino up to one side of this bus so that I could use it as a normal UART connection just to read some of the information that was going backwards and forwards between these two modules. And then it occurred to me that even if I didn't have a real RS-485 chip to do this connection properly, I could sort of fake it by making uh, using two pins of my Arduino and making one of them go low and one of them go high at the same time and just sort of pretend to be a 485 connection and wasn't really expecting it to work but it actually did at least uh, I think it mostly worked because I got a reply from the other module eventually but we'll get to that in a minute um, but basically what you do is you use one pin uh, the yellow one in this case just as a normal UART connection so I did this by rewriting the software serial class and I made my own class called Software RS-485. Uh, and all it does is whenever one pin would normally be written high, it has this other pin that it will take low at the same time, and vice versa. So this yellow line that we're looking at here would just be a plain old RS, a, a plain old UART signal. And I've chosen this byte because it has a 101010, so we can see uh, where the ones and the zeros are in this uh, set of pulses there. And at the moment, the blue line's doing nothing. But what you need to do is, when it's your turn to talk, so this would normally be the this would be the listening state. When it's your turn to talk, you take that other pin low at the beginning of your talking. Uh, so you are now driving this line low, and then you make it go high when the other one's going low, and vice versa. And then when you're finished talking on the bus, you um, stop driving it or set set it to a uh, what do you call it? You set the output. 
it's an output pin, but you set the value of it, and it sort of gives it a pull up high or something like that. And anyway, it was a bit of a hack, but it actually seemed to work. So I was quite excited by that. And I tried continuing on with my original plan of emulating the attendant control unit. But unfortunately, though, there was no response whatsoever from any of the other components in the system when I had my fake pulses going in there. So I've just recorded a little bit of this from the oscilloscope. And you can see that we have, I'll just pause it there. Um, this is the remote, this is the power module, and this is my fake RS-485 pulses here. Uh, and they were just completely ignored. And you can see there that the levels are a little bit different. So my ones are going right up to 5 volts. And the normal ones on the bus are more like a bit over 4 volts there. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, but it didn't seem like it would be an issue. So I was a bit puzzled as to what was going on. And I just sort of assumed that this fake sort of hackery that I was doing with my software RS-485 class was just not going to cut it and I should probably use a proper Max 485 chip to do this connection. But since I was still waiting for my Max 485 modules to arrive in the mail, I thought while I was waiting I might try removing the remote from the system and putting my Arduino in place of that and try and pretend to be the remote. And one problem with that is that the remote has to generate that full battery voltage pulse for 300 milliseconds to make everything start up. So what I did was I just did that manually, and I used a Zener diode to limit the voltage on the bus lines to no more than 5 or 4.7 volts or something like, like that. Uh, and to my surprise, I actually got a response. Uh, this is not the exact thing. I'm not sure which this is, but um, I think this is this is a correct response from the normal system. So this is the uh, remote saying something and then the power module is replying. I think that's what this is here. Um, unfortunately though, it even though I got a response from the power module, it wasn't the response that I wanted because one of these bytes here, I think it's this one here, this zero here means that everything's okay. So it's a sort of an error flag. Uh, and the response that I had here was C9 and the 9 means shark cable fault. That's all the information I have on it. It just says shark cable fault. No idea how to look up this stuff further because there's precious little information on this on the internet as it is. So this sort of reinforced my thinking that maybe I just needed to get a proper Max 485 module and try it with one of those instead of messing around with my silly fake RS-485 system. So eventually these Max 485 thingies arrived and I bought three of them because they're quite cheap and I'm glad I did because I blew up two of them pretty quickly. I managed to get the same problem, shark cable fault basically, I got the same thing again before I blew them up and I also blew up an Arduino as well and mainly the reason I did that because is I took out a resistor somewhere that I had in my circuit that I actually needed and before I realized what was going on I was down one Arduino and two of these things but not before I could figure out that this wasn't actually going to help me with my shark cable fault error. So next I decided to bite the bullet and buy one of these attendant control unit things. And my thinking for doing this was that I was still not completely sure if the messages that I was trying to send were correct because I wasn't sure if the wheelchair that I have was using the same version of software that I had managed to get the PDF document for that was explaining how the messages worked. It seemed like it was, but I couldn't be sure. So what, the reason I wanted to get this is so that I could look at the messages that this, this thing was sending and copy them just verbatim, basically, and get something that I knew exactly the bytes that I was sending were what I should be sending. So I found one of these on eBay. Fortunately, there were some cheap ones around. I thought, you know, this is the way that I want to do it, and if, if I'm going to be stubborn about it, I might just have to take one for the team and spend a bit of money. And you can see this cost me uh, $110 or so. Half of it was shipping, which is a pity, but came from the US of A there. Um, it's the only place that they had them for sale for a reasonable price. Some of these, some of these were being sold for ridiculous prices. Couldn't believe it. But this one I thought was quite reasonable. Um, speaking of shipping. Is it just me, or do you think they could have possibly used a smaller box for this? Uh, anyway, so it just plugs into the bus with that 7-pin uh, plug there, probably just using the 4 pins, this one. In fact, yeah, definitely using just the 4 pins. And has on the bottom a switch which clicks off and on, so 
presumably when you click it on like that, that will take control over from the normal joystick on the front of the chair. And then as you keep turning it up like that, you can control the speed up to rabbit and down to turtle like that. And as usual, it's very smooth, high quality feeling control and the click is very nice and satisfying as well. I'm, I'm really impressed with, with the quality of all the stuff on this chair. It's, it's very, very nice. <clears throat> and then the only other thing that's on it is a joystick like that to control it. So I hope this works because, yeah, so what I'm saying about cheating is now all I have to do is listen to what this thing is doing and uh, we'll have all the answers. So let me just plug it into the chair and see if it actually works. It looks like it works fine. Uh, so normally you see this screen and it says ready to drive and the bottom right corner there's a GT for G-Track, that's the gyro status thing. And then when I, when I switch this on it flashes control inhibited for just a minute, or just a brief second. And now we have this little icon in the bottom right of the screen. And actually I haven't tried controlling it yet, but presumably, yeah. Uh, so forward, here we go. Lovely. <laughs> I got you now. So it's a pity that I had to spend the hundred bucks to get that, um, but it's possible that I could sell that actually once I've done with it. I, I only need to know what messages it's sending down this bus and then I can get rid of it. So maybe I could get 50 bucks back for it, who knows. Um, but ha even having spent that, that was $110, right? If I had have bought a Sabertooth controller, that would have been about 120 So it's sort of about the same cost, but I would have ended up with far less features or, well, like all the safety stuff has yet to be discovered. Maybe there's going to be some problems. A lot, I hear a lot of people saying that the um, safety features that this thing has can be a little bit annoying for what I'm trying to do. But one thing I really do like is the brake that it has. So uh, you can hear that quite strong brake clicking and clacking, um, which I think is going to be a good thing to have especially if I'm going to be driving up on slopes. I mean, there are not actually that many slopes here, <laughs> but fortunately, the, fortunately there is one right outside my place, which I would like to use for testing just to make sure it can actually do that. It's not much of a slope, just there in the middle of the screen. Uh, but it's kind of handy to have that. So, yeah, just to make sure if it's capable of stopping on a slope, um, it's going to be really handy to have that break. So I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of glad, still glad that I didn't go the Sabertooth controller route at this point. Just playing around with this a bit more, I've discovered a couple of slightly annoying drawbacks. One is that the maximum speed that you can get with this attendant control unit thing is only as fast as this first level goes, which kind of makes sense because it's supposed to be used when a person is walking along behind the chair, so you can't really go at a jogging pace which is like, this level three is pretty fast, like definitely faster than walking pace. It's sort of a, a leisurely jog, I think. Uh, so you don't really want to have the attendant having to do that while he's or she's um, walking along behind the chair. So that kind of makes sense, but it's a little bit annoying that I can't go faster than uh, this. So at least it feels like that. I may be imagining, imagining it, but it could be actually a little bit slower than this speed. Um, but anyway, it's definitely not faster than that, which is one annoying point. Uh, the another, another annoying point is that the control of the tilt mechanism on the chair with that other actuator is done by... You can see that the attendant is active there. And I can use this button to switch to controlling the tilt of the chair and now I can use this to actually make it happen. Of course it's not connected so it doesn't do anything but you can see that the screen is responding when I use the attendant control joystick like that. But the problem with that is that the switch, the toggle between controlling the chair, uh, controlling the tilt and actually driving the chair is on the main joystick part. 
which means I can't really do that remotely. So I can't control the tilt actuator by radio control, at least not if I'm just emulating this thing. So that's a bit of a bummer. Um, let me just show you the speed of this, just in case it uh, wasn't clear from last time, but if I turn the attendant control on right all the way up to rabbit, and we go forwards, this is as fast as we can go. To be sure, that is quite a comfortable walking pace, so it makes sense, but it is a little bit annoying for what I'm trying to do. Unfortunately though, this plan of attack was doomed to fail as well, because when I connected it up and I tried to look at the signals on my oscilloscope, I saw the first set of pulses from the shark remote, second one from the power module, and then nothing, even though it was working. So after a bit of head scratching, I realized what it was doing was it was not using this two, these two wire or bus wires here. It was actually using these two up here. And not only was it a different, completely different bus, but it was running at a different voltage. I think it was 3.3 .3 volts. And I could not for the life of me figure out what the board rate was. So it didn't seem to be I squared C either. Um, and I don't think it could be SPI. This was a, this was actually um, I forget whether that was ground or positive voltage, but it wasn't any kind of a signal. So these two here are, were the bus lines for this other bus. So what it seems to be doing is that the remote and the attendant control unit were having a private conversation between themselves, unbeknownst to this power module, and then the remote was passing on the information that the attendant control unit had overridden it to do and the power module was just obeying the remote as if the remote was the only thing in the system because from this point of view of this that's all there was so I think that was sort of a backwards compatibility system so that this thing could be an older model and it wouldn't need to know about a newer model of this thing um, so that's a pretty good idea but uh, I found it a little bit annoying because I couldn't really do anything with it so basically I just wasted some money on that or I can sell it again I suppose I was starting to get a bit frustrated at this point so I thought what I might do is go back and try something that I'd seen a while ago there is a guy called Tony Matthews from Australia and he has been developing something to do exactly what I'm trying to do basically but I thought I would stubbornly try and do everything all by myself and come up with something different um, but it was starting to look like that was not to be so I thought I'd go back and try this because he has something running with at least one chair that he has, possibly even more, uh, and he's designed a fairly nice circuit board to keep everything nice and tidy because I was getting a horrible mess of wires every time I tried to do something here. So I thought it'd be nice to have a purpose-built board. Um, this is a long thread, by the way. He's been working on this for a pretty good while, and he's had some help from the people on this wheelchairdriver.com uh, forum. And... Um, he has been very dedicated to this and put in a lot of effort as far as I can see so hats off to Tony for all efforts that effort that has gone into this and the main thing that I learned here that was a sort of a light bulb switching on moment for me was how to handle making the Arduino do this full battery voltage pulse without getting the full battery voltage pulse coming into the sensitive chips on here um, and he's done that by using something called a Maxim DG419, which we'll just have a quick look at here. It is a analog switch. So it's just a switch as if you had manually flipped the switch, except it allows the Arduino to do that. And crucially, there is a single pole double throw option. So that is the 419, this one here. So these two are just single pole single throws there. Um, but this one very importantly lets you take a switch or it takes this input well output whatever it is it's just a switch so it could be an input or an output I guess uh, and it lets you choose between whether you want to connect it to this one or that one and this is exactly what we need to do so uh, this one in the middle here in the case of what we're building will be the shark bus high so it'll be one of those bus lines there and when we connect it to this one it can go to full battery voltage and when we switch the switch the other way it can go into the 485 chip like normal uh, communications you know, just the 5 volt levels uh, and it's not going to be connected to both of those at the same time which is very important so we get to do exactly what we wanted to do basically 
Um, so I thought I would buy a few of these boards, or I actually intended to only buy one, but I got lots of them, um, as I'll show you just in a minute. Um, not sure which version I got because he's up uploading different versions fairly regularly. I think I got this one maybe. Okay, it's a few weeks later now, actually more like a month later, and I finally have everything together to try building one of these. The circuit boards arrived this morning. When I opened up the package, I was pleasantly surprised to realize that I had made a bit of a misunderstanding when I purchased these. I thought I was only buying one, but when I look at the order again, it says Protopack plus or minus 10, <laughs> and I got 12. So I guess I lucked out. I got an extra two um, as well. So anyway, that's great, and they look to be very well made. Nice screen printing. We'll have a look, closer look at one in a minute. Um, this is the stuff that I got from Mouser. I actually got this one from Banggood. I got a couple of other things from Banggood that Mouser had, but I didn't really feel like paying for. They, the prices were not really that cheap on Mouser, um, but they do have everything you need, including the specialist things like the DG419 chip and uh, these Traco Power, th <coughs> power things. Where are they? There we go, I think. What's this? Oh yeah, RS-485 chip. So I got enough to build four of these, um, just because I was spending a bit of money on shipping, and I thought I might as well get a bunch of other things as well. So there's a few other things that are not related to this project, but I got them just because I didn't want to spend money on shipping just for nothing. Anyway, um, so that's that, and I have a full set of stuff that I'm going to need to put one of these together. I think I have everything. So there's a couple of diodes, a couple of resistors, a couple of capacitors, <laughs> a couple of these, and a couple of ICs. And there's a couple of everything except for this. This is all on his loan. There's no couple of this. There's only one of them. Um, yeah, so this was a little bit pricey actually. I originally thought that instead of getting one of these I would just use this sort of um, voltage regulator step down thing that I have tons of. Like I buy, buy these by the tens for my Arduino projects and usually step down to 5 volts. And a lot of these can actually handle the 24 volts input that the wheelchair would have. But I thought um, just you know since I'm buying a bunch of things and since the circuit board is set up to nicely use it, I might as well get one of these. Um, so that's what I've done. So let's have a look at this board. Well, we've already looked at it a little bit, but uh, now we have one in the flesh, so to speak, to have a look at. And you can see it's quite nicely made. This um, webcam I'm using doesn't seem to focus on the edges of the video, unfortunately, but you can see right in the middle, if I show you that it's the screen printing's all very nicely clearly done the holes are perfectly sized there's actually three four there's three different sizes of holes on here so the ones for the Arduino itself are small then these ones are a little bit larger and these ones are a little bit larger and then if I guess if you count those yeah anyway so there's quite a lot of work gone into these so I'm glad I've got the 10 and you can see on the back there it is a two-layer board. There's, uh, there's a few vias here and there, not too many. Just enough to be useful and not so many that it's difficult to follow where the traces are going. And you can see on there, code and design by Tony Matthews, Gold Coast Australia, that says under there, with assistance of members from wheelchairdriver.com and Jim. That would be Jim Connor, I think. Um, so it says code and design. So I think originally I'll start off using Tony's code but of course this code part I will be changing to my own one later on. Anyway, uh, enough talk about that, let's put it together. Okay, have everything assembled there except for putting the Arduino on. I've got to say that was a very pleasant soldering experience. Um, very simple, nice quality solder pads, the solder takes to them very well. Very easy, everything fits in just nicely. The only thing I'm a little bit concerned about is that this 1k resistor here which is supposed to be a 1 watt power rating looks a hell of a lot smaller than the place that is specified for it on the board but they are definitely 1 watt resistors that's in there and it says there 1 watt 1k so I guess maybe the physical size of these is not necessarily 
needing to be large. Maybe they can dissipate one watt even when they're the same size as these quarter watt ones like that. I think that's a quarter watt one there, and it looks about the same size. But um, when I thought about what this was for, this is only supposed to be on for that 300 millisecond pulse when the 24 volts is coming through and to, where does it go? Oh, it goes into the high line on the RS485 bus. So it's only going to be in use for 300 milliseconds. So I figured, well, what the hell, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's the wrong power rating. But if you think about it a little bit more, you have to make sure that you get the program right so that you, you are only opening that switch for the 300 milliseconds, in which case a small power, uh, power rating resistor might be okay. But if you made a mistake in your firmware, software, on here, <laughs> it could be necessary to have a big uh, wattage resistor there just in case that was open for more than, or closed I guess, closed for more than the 300 milliseconds. Anyway, I think it'll be okay. Okay, so I've put the Arduino on there now and I've tried powering through this voltage regulator to run the Arduino and I noticed a bit of a problem. I actually noticed this before I put it together, believe it or not, when I was looking at the circuit board uh, I was looking at it in quite a bit of detail, trying to figure out how it was getting 5 volt power to run the Arduino. And it turns out that one of the traces that is supposed to be here is actually not there. So if we look at this, this is the bottom right corner where, so this pin, this fourth from the right pin is the VCC pin of the Arduino Nano. And you can see here that there's a blue trace going through here. So this red one is the 5 volt rail, and there's a little blue trace here, if we can, whoops, see if I can zoom in on that so we get a better look at it. There is definitely a blue trace on the back. I think the blue lines here are on the reverse side of the board, but when we look at this board here, well, all of them presumably will be the same, so there's no... Um, so just in between that hole and that hole there should be a trace either on this side or the other side but there's no trace on either side so I guess maybe this just means that the version of this design that Tony uploaded was a little bit out of date or something like that um, and like I say I noticed that before I put it together and I thought that's a bit strange but maybe maybe it'll work anyway but the outcome of that is that when you're powering it through here I'm powering it with 15 volts at the moment. Um, the LED will come on, but it's a little bit dim because the power is not coming directly to this VCC pin. It's sort of going through the DG419 or the RS485 somehow to power the Arduino in a roundabout way, and it's not getting the full power into there. Uh, so it's not a big deal because I can just put a little solder bridge across those two pins there, and everything should be fine. I have not done that yet because if I run it, from the USB from my computer like this it runs fine anyway but obviously when I put this on the wheelchair in the, in the final version I'll have to put a little bit of solder across those two pins to bridge that gap um, so now uh, I've connected up the receiver here in the way that is described in the sketch so there's a, if we look at the top of the sketch there's some pins here saying um, which receiver pins should be connected to which digital pins on the Arduino, so I've done that. Um, and I struck another little issue. This could be something to do with this receiver that I'm using. So let me just... I have to turn this power supply on here to, to power the receiver. So I'll do that now. Unfortunately, it's a bit noisy, but... Okay, so now we should have some power to our receiver. Yes, um, we turn this on. So I've set it up so that this switch will turn the wheelchair on and when it does the standard LED pin number 13 will turn on here and let's see what that does. And it's flashing. Maybe you can see that there. And I thought that's kind of strange because I didn't see anywhere in the source code that it should be flashing. So I put a little bit of debugging code in and I just turn the switch off again. We'll see. I'm I'm printing out the pulse length of this switch, so it's at about a thousand microseconds at the moment, and it'll go up to about two thousand when I flick the switch, and that'll turn it on. Now, if I just stop that scrolling, 
we can see it's turning off and on continuously which is why the LED is turning off and on and the pulse length that this channel is giving is zero which it should not be because you know it's switched down it should be giving us about 2000 microseconds so looking into that a little bit more I noticed that the method used here for obtaining the length of the pulse is this function here called pulse in which admittedly I had never heard of until seeing this uh, and it's a little bit of a shortcut way to do um, pulse width modulation detecting without using an interrupt so you just say which pin you want to listen on and which uh, whether you want to listen for a high pulse or a low pulse and then you give a timeout in microseconds so this is 25 milliseconds like hmm? microsecond yeah 25 milliseconds um, which turns out to be a little bit short so to stop rambling about this all I needed to do here was increase that to 250,000 microseconds which is 250 milliseconds right I think yeah uh, and if I upload that sketch now and we'll just go back to the serial monitor there now we'll see that it turns on and the pulse stays the LED stays on and off it just stays whichever way you put it um, so that should be good enough for now obviously in future I'll be I won't be using this I'll be using my own radio system um, probably using PPM to start with and then using an NRF24 module later on to do a little bit more sophisticated and also have some telemetry coming back from the wheelchair to let us know a little bit of information about what's going on at the remote endpoint. Um, so for now that looks like it's running okay and I have noticed the voltages on this um, RS485 bus, these two terminals here are changing. I connected my oscilloscope to the RS485 bus lines just to see if everything is working and it seems to be fine so if I switch my radio switch there you'll see we get a high pulse just briefly and then we get a very nice looking up and down uh, so the let's see the blue trace or the blue line on the graph is connected to the A of the circuit board so that's A which just happens to say blue below it I'm not sure what this blue and yellow is from maybe it's the, one of the wheelchairs that Tony has that um, has yellow and blue wires for the bus lines but anyway happens to be the same as the colors I've got here so blue is A yellow is yellow on here is B just by coincidence and it looks great and if I move the stick so I'm using the pitch and roll stick to uh, control the wheelchair hopefully you can see that the message the bytes in this message are changing can you, can you see my fingers moving the stick there in the reflection of the scope screen probably can and you can see it fluctuating a little bit in the message and when I let it go it stops so anyway I connected it up to the wheelchair and the result of this was wait for it shark cable fault again so it's back to the same old thing even though I can't I just have no idea what to do now um, this is the circuit diagram of I'm pretty sure this is up to date with the board that I was using um, we'll come back and look at this in a minute um, but let's just look at some good pulses before we look at the bad pulses that were the result of um, this connection so the good pulse when everything starts up like this we have the bus high goes very high like this so that's uh, what is that 22 volts or something there and bus low stays at about 5 volts doesn't change through that startup pulse so that's one thing to keep an eye on and this is what the pulses look like under normal operation when the remote and the power module are just talking to each other while the chair is on um, so notice that the uh, the high comes down to about one volt and the low goes up to about four well three and a three point seven volts maybe something like that now what is this so, yeah just under four volts whatever and there's a pretty good space between them so um, as far as I know it's this difference in voltages here when this goes over 200 millivolts 
the uh, system considers that to be uh, a one, or is it a one or a zero, whatever. It considers this difference here to be uh, a signal that's received correctly. 200 millivolts is supposed to be the the limit there, the threshold. Uh, so these are the good pulses that we should expect. Um, and occasionally I was finding this problem here. This is now, we're looking at the trace from Tony's board that was connected to my chair when I started it up. This is the startup pulse and it was supposed to be full battery voltage up to here somewhere but it only goes up to just a bit over 5 volts, say 6 volts or so and I found that this would happen if you turn the chair on or you, yeah, turned it on because the power module would wake up and respond but it would say shark cable fault so it's still running um, then if you turned it off and then you tried to turn it on again within 10 seconds you'd get this faulty startup pulse that only went up to 6 volts and that seems to be a problem with the power module staying powered up for 10 seconds and after 10 seconds this problem would not occur so you'd get get this high pulse again when you started it up uh, and I think the only way around that is to have the remote that we're emulating uh, request a power down from the power module that's something that I can do once once I get into my element so to speak with the software writing which is what I'm better at than all this farting around with circuits um, that should be pretty easy to do so that's not a not an issue uh, another problem I noticed that's maybe not a huge problem but I did notice that when the startup pulse was being sent the high bus bus high we're now looking at 5 volts per vertical would go up to high fine but it would also pull up the bus low so you can see it's been pulled up from 5 volts to uh, whatever that is 7 or something and pretty sure that's not supposed to happen and I think the reason for that is that there is a 22k resistor between bus A and B and I did not see anywhere in the instructions that said that should be there so I took it out and then I got the normal result where this low pulse didn't go up at all so I'm pretty sure this is not supposed to be here I'll show you in a minute why I think Tony might have put that there okay now this this is probably the core of the problem at the moment so this is the pulses coming from my or Tony's Tony's board looks good right everything looks great there so we'll just go back to what it's supposed to be this is the pulse from the actual official device the remote that and that looks looks the same now this pulse here is the reply from the power module which does not look good at all this is what it should look like all at the same level as the first set of pulses like that but this is the result that I'm getting so there's a couple of problems here there's some nasty big spikes going up to what is that uh, six seven kind of almost seven volts some of these little spikes so it's a very uh, very rough looking at some points but probably a bigger problem is that the high doesn't go down anywhere near low enough and the low doesn't come up anywhere near high enough and it looks to me like there is almost a 200 millivolt difference there so I found that my logic analyzer would not detect this um, the only way I could get it to detect was to switch it over to connecting to this yellow trace and then invert the result so that I could um, read it with my um, interpreter logic analyzers interpreter and again it was saying shark cable fault um, so yeah so these pulses again this is coming from the official equipment this is the shark power module giving this pulse but I think the reason that the voltages are not able to go to the right levels is because of something that's been done in this circuit that's not letting those pulses get to the right voltage level yeah so that is a bit of a bit of a bummer to say the least and here is a little bit more of a zoom in on the reply from the power module so that we can see those spikes a bit better so it seems like those spikes are right at the beginning of every one of these switchovers just for a brief nanosecond type length uh, okay so let's get back to this and as I said I took this 22k resistor out and you'll notice that there are no 270 ohm resistors in this circuit anywhere which I was a little bit puzzled about because they are mentioned in the uh, specifications the PDF that Jim Connor managed to get hold of so I was a bit puzzled that they weren't there 
But I thought maybe Tony's chair that he has, obviously it works without them. So I was just sort of hoping that my chair would as well. But as I mentioned earlier, I think my chair may be a little bit newer version of the stuff that he has. So perhaps my chair has an extra error check in it to test for this kind of funny voltage situation um, and refuse to function if the remote is not doing everything just perfectly. And in Tony's Arduino sketch, he's not even attempting to read any information back from the power module. I, I will be because I want to know the voltage and uh, a few other things. Um, so he may not have noticed that this was a problem. And like I say, his chair may be a little bit more lenient about how it deals with this. But anyway, just to finish off, I'll just show you a little excerpt from the PDF that uh, we all managed to get hold of and we've been poring over for so long, or I have. Um, I'll just show you this bit here because it describes the electrical specification that these two bus lines are supposed to be working on. And I'm really hoping that somebody watching this video might be able to make a little bit more sense of this and figure out what we're doing wrong, what I'm doing wrong. I mean, it's working okay for Tony, but... Um, <laughs> what I need to do to, to get this working properly, I guess, is the question. So it says here that the bus high is pulled down to 0 volts by 270 ohms in parallel with 22 kilo ohms at the power module and at the remote, which means that it should be in here somewhere. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I should have that in here somewhere, but I don't. Um, and the other thing I thought was a bit strange, it says, pulled down to zero volts and, and then 20, 22 kilo ohms. But that's not what we have here. We have 22 kilo ohms going across the A and B lines. So B is bus high. I would have thought that this 22K should be going from bus B to ground. Wouldn't you? I mean, that's what it says to me on this text. So maybe I'm reading this wrong or Tony read it wrong but anyway I found that that 22k resistor was not necessary um, and then bus low is pulled up to 5 volts with a 270 ohm resistor as well uh, so I guess if anybody is uh, savvy about this stuff you'll be able to read this and understand it for yourself but basically I'm, I'm thinking that there should be some 270 ohm resistors in here at some point so I tried that as well I tried them all over the place. I put a 270 ohm resistor between bus B and ground, and then, uh, not no, sorry, not directly between bus B and ground because it can't be on there when the full battery voltage pulse comes through. So I put a 270 ohm resistor between uh, this side. So this is the MAX485, this is the, the switch. So I put a 270 ohm resistor from here to ground and then I put one from here to plus 5 volts as it sort of suggests to me here um, pulled up to 5 volts with a 270 ohm resistor uh, and through a diode, I put a diode in there as well but that didn't make any difference at all uh, then I tried putting a 270 ohm resistor across here <laughs> just in case that was what it meant that didn't make any difference either uh, it did sort of squash the pulses together a bit so Instead of the top and the bottom being here, the top and the bottom were more like about three and a half and one. So it squished them in a bit, but didn't do anything useful other than that. Um, and I tried this, what else? I put that 270 ohm resistor in one other place too that I forget, but it just didn't make any difference at all. So I'm really stuck. Um, it's getting a bit annoying. I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm really out of my depth. Um, I'm a software guy, really. I'm just sort of... Want it, want to get it to the point where I can just get on with the bloody coding and leave all the stuff behind me. I'll be very happy when I get to that point. Um, so I think I'll just leave it here. And if anybody has any tips, please let me know. Um, hopefully I can get this figured out. Otherwise, I might just have to give up and buy one of those, uh, what are they, saber tooth <laughs> controllers. But I really don't want to. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the end of the video. Oh, by the way, this cap here, is, I think this is supposed to go between here and ground it's not not a series connection there i think it's just a slight um, drawing error anyway so that's the end of this video unfortunately couldn't make it more interesting but um, that's all i have for now so thanks for watching and i'll see you next time with some good results hopefully